So first of all, I got to ask you, 76 years young, you just turned 76 less than a week ago or a week ago. How, what the hell do, do you do to stay in such great shape? It looks like you can do better than the, than the backfield that we got currently over there in Miami. <laughs> no, this is for survival purposes only. I, uh, I, I've been working out since I was about mm, 12 or 13 and I never really kind of skipped a beat. Oh, and, wow. um, I still work out now. I used to warm up for 15 minutes and then work out for 55 minutes. Now I warm up for 55 minutes and I work out for 15 minutes. <laughs> and what's your regimen? What, what, what do you do? Uh, generally about four days a week. Uh, I have a gym upstairs, my home gym, and I have a gym called Planet Fitness that I go to when I need to be on other kinds of machines. I, I, listen, the fact that I may look a certain way in no way reflects the eight years that I played in the NFL, For sure. four years I played in college. I played 20 years from 56 to 76, and yeah. I'm still – I still have some of the repercussions from that accumulation at that time. And these kids today, they, they don't see that there's going to be a time when the recklessness of pursuit of violence mm. is, is transferred onto the field. But the residual effect of that is when you get older, you see why, the average life, the average age of a person who played five years or more is 56. So right. that means for everybody that lives to be 76, there's somebody that dies at 56. Wow. So and we've had half our guys are gone now. Yeah. Um, I said, but it's been a slow process, not effectuating like the way you see younger guys going out. Junior stay out. Mm. There's a perfect example piece, right yeah. there. Exactly. You know, but uh, just the zeal in which these guys have the effort to play and entertain people. So you find them doing things that they normally wouldn't do. And the league is kind of letting them go and, and be these people who they are because that's who they have as people who are playing on the field and their fan base is in the stands watching. And that's so, the game, and that's the game, per the yep. rules, right? You know, the, those are the, the rules of the game. And even with all of the kind of, you know, reformation of those rules, it's still extremely violent, you know, as we yeah. all saw, as the world saw last Monday night, you know, um, in Cincinnati, um, right. you know, and thankfully, you know, uh, DeMar Hamlin is, is talking and he's healthy again, or not healthy, but he's, you know, he's on the comeback, you know, trail, right. which is, which is obviously amazing. And, and like, that was just a reminder that even we all complain and I do it too. I complain like, um, you know, like there's this meme that uh, there's like a five second clip of like all of these highlights that were promoting football on CBS, you know, and yeah. every single play in the highlight reel is a penalty today. You know, so they they've done so, <laughs> yeah, they've done so much to change the game. Even when you played, the technology of the helmet was nowhere near what it is today. And if you look at old tape of Mercury Morris playing football, and I highly recommend that you do, he was yeah. something to behold in the backfield. You you used to run like you didn't give a, a damn about anything, including yourself. Actually, now I, that's how it occurred to you from the stands. Right. But from me, and listen very carefully, mm. I learned how to play the game from touch football, and I never abandoned the principle. <laughs> if they can't touch you, they can't tackle you. So yeah. that takes away automatically the flight or fight aspect of nature, which two, two lions fight over the same piece, one guy leaves. Mm. Two, two tigers fight over the same thing, one guy leaves. Uh, Mad Max and the Thunderdome. Two men enter, one man leave. That happens right. every 30 seconds. Right, so right. you have to be conscious of where you are. <clears throat> guys used to say to me, <clears throat> uh, hey, Merck, man, you know, I used to love that I see this guy. He's like 55 now, but he was like 10 when I was playing. Man, I used to go to Orange Bowl, sneak in and watch you, man. Man, I love the way you used to make them guys miss. I said, no, man. I didn't make them miss. I made them think they had me. They right. missed on their own. <laughs> right. Oh man, so cool, man! So cool to get to talk to you. Um, 
I I have to tell you a quick little story because I went to South Miami Elementary School. Oh, um, get out! Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, there was this one time where they put us all in the uh, in the in the in the cafeteria, and you came out and you gave a speech. And we were, I think, I was in sixth grade. I was in sixth uh -huh. grade because I'll never forget this. And um, you gave up and you gave this incredible talk to us. And the amazing thing about this talk that has never left my mind, Mr. Morris, and I'm so thankful for you for it, is that it was a very difficult conversation that you had with us. It was a conversation about some of the bad things that had happened to you in life. Um, and it was really, it wasn't even about sports as much as it was about learning how to avoid the wrong decisions in life. And at that kind of, you know, like nowadays, you might not even be allowed to have those type of conversations with sixth graders, right? Because <laughs> sixth graders is elementary school, right? It's, it's very young. Right, right. You know? And I respect that. But you came up there and you told us your story about, you know, what led to the situation that you got into in the early right. 80s and stuff like that. Right. And that stayed with me forever because I understood even somebody that is Mr. Perfect himself could fall down the rabbit hole of bad decisions and have to pay those consequences. And that, that was a very illuminating moment in my life, man. And I want to just thank you for that, you know, 45 well, years you. later, whatever it is. So <laughs> thank you very much for that, you know, for that honesty. Yeah. Well, you know what, man, there are two parallels on that track that I took. Um, and as a matter of fact, about, I want to say four days ago, I finished a, a, a story that I wrote, a, a sequel to a book that, that I co-authored called Against the Grain. Mm. And in 1982, when I got busted, and you're going to see this, and the story underneath the story here is still trying to be suppressed at this day, mm. which caused me to have to write The Quest to Clear My Name an indictment of the state of mind of the state of Florida. I just finished it maybe three days ago mm. and I'm getting ready to, to make this move with this story because I'm coming after the state of Florida because they wrongfully and willfully intended to bust Mercury Morris, knowing full well that Mercury Morris and what they tried to get him to do mm -hmm. was to was to give up five players on the Miami Dolphin team. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you too much but sure. because I want you to read it yep. so you can understand the context of the narrative that was created back then about drugs. I just happen to be a good example of if you, how many times do you touch a hot stove? Twice. First and last time. Right, and right. if you learn from that, then it's about what your perception is about what you see. Uh, I was involved with cocaine and and uh, anybody who was who was in that world just because I was a person who was uh, there's a word called anti disestablishment and terrorism. Mm. And it means that you're basically against everything that has to do with society. And at that time, as I'm watching it right now, I'm watching a guy named Ron DeSantis tell me that I can't say the word gay right. or take, putting, you know, that it's getting to a point where the ridiculousness of people. And back then it was about drugs. So they tried to put me in a position that I would give up other players. What right. I'm about to tell you is that in 1982, when I got busted, they were, the instant I w went down to the, to the, to the uh, station or down to the Dade County State Attorney's Office and my two co-defendants, they went to jail. They came to me. And the very first thing that came out of this asshole by the name of George Yoss, the prosecutor then, and I use free speech for that, mm -hmm. is that the first thing he said was, I want to know the names of everybody you know in the NFL that ever smoked a joint or did a line of coke. Right. 
That was his first thing he said. So this same guy, when Don Reese and Randy Crowder got busted in 1977, mm. Crowder's, Crowder still living. Reese is dead. Crowder told me that when they – nine days they pursued these guys. Nine days in order to put cocaine in their hand so that 30 seconds after they got busted, this same asshole, George Yoss, mm-hmm. he came to them and said, hey, listen, you know, uh, you're in big trouble now, but I can tell you right now, Shula won't know, Robbie won't know, uh, that co- co- nobody will know. All you have to do is tell us that Mercury Morris gave you this cocaine. Wow. That was in 1977. They refused and of course, they did a year and a half in, I mean, a year and a day in jail. And the judge cited the fact that the prosecution had been so relentless in trying to pursue them to put cocaine in their hand. Mm. It just happened to be that an informant who was my gardener went to them, uh, to the state attorney's office after he got busted and said, I can give you Mercury Morse. Because he's he's selling coke and he's got a plenty of it. And instead of them doing the protocol right. to find out whether or not the guy's lying, they jumped right in. And so they said, OK, call him and tell him you got a buyer and tell him you saw the money. And so now I don't know what's going on. All I know is that this guy who was cutting my grass, he says, hey, uh, I know somebody wants a coke. You, you want some? You, they want to buy it from you. You want to sell it? He told them I had a half a kilo of cocaine in my house. Oh, my Lord. And, and they pursued that as if it were true instead of like maybe a lie detector test is what they normally do for a guy who's coming off the street to try to get himself out of an issue. He's coming off the street to put me in a circumstance because he told me six months before that, he says, I'm going to get even with you, buddy. So he goes to a guy named Eugene Gottbaum, who was a guy who worked in a hospital, but he grew up with this guy. They went to high school together. And he tells Gottbaum in in June of 1982, I'm going to set Mercury Morris up on a drug deal because he 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 owes me money and and he won't pay me. And so then two months later, after he did it, he goes back to the guy and says, well, I uh, uh." I told you we were going to set him, set him up, and we got him because that was the same day that I got busted. So the state of mind of the state of Florida coordinated this whole effort. I went to trial. They thought I was going to plead in. That's what their whole – because it was necessary for me to plead guilty at, in, in with all of the overbearance of a 15-year mandatory mm. and the toughest judge. And uh, you, if you if you make a deal with us – I'm making no deals. You set me up and now you want me to get out of it by doing that. I'm making no deals. Mm. So then, and I'm only 33 at 35 then. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then I'm by, I'm down to the last day. My two co-defendants, they played in the guy who owned, had the Coke. He, he, he testified against me. So here's the guy who's got the cocaine. The only witness they have is the guy who has the cocaine. Right, because you don't even have it. You don't even have to have have it. He had it. (laughs) Right, 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 right. It's crazy. It's crazy. So then he then testifies against me. And then there's this cop uh, named John Wayne Johnson who, who was the first person to get to me. He came running into my backyard. All this you're going to read because I'm going to send you the book. I'm oh, gonna send please, you please. But all this he goes to read, he says, he says, make one move and I'll scatter your fucking brains all over Miami. I said, oh just treat God. me like a man. And so then I knew I was in a, tra- a jackpot because Fred Donaldson, my gardener, when he told me I'm going to get even with you, buddy, that's exactly what he did. But instead of the state of Florida trying to make sure they were going to do something right, they had already been connected into it in 1977 when right. they busted Reese and Crowder. So they just knew that I was going to go. So now I don't plead in because I'm relying on the system. As crazy as that sounds, and the, the truth. system itself will work if you don't allow them to play you in the system. So in other words, innocent mm-hmm. until proven guilty, but then you get to appeal what they've done. There were no witnesses against me except the Coke dealer uh, and the guy who inf- was the informant. They couldn't put him on the stand because they couldn't afford to have the jury, which was all white mm. in 1982. 
So if you're going to have a paint a guy into a corner, then the first thing you do is you make sure he has no access to the process. Mm. And that's what they did in 1982. So now I get convicted on November 5th, 1982. I'm, a, I'm got, about to be sentenced on January 20th, 1983. And uh, three days before I get three days before I get sentenced, a guy comes from Sports Illustrated. His name is Martin Dardis. Mm. Dardis was formerly an investigator for the Dade County State Attorney's Office who went to work for Sports Illustrated as they, if you, you're too young to remember now, but in the 80s, there was this, this time when Sports Illustrated became this sports scandal journalism uh, a sidebar where they would do things and, and go after guys that, that had been known involved in cocaine. They did it with Don Reese. When Reese got out of prison, out of jail, out of prison, he only did a year and a day. But when they did it, they went to him. They paid him thirty thousand dollars. Don Reese, twenty thousand of it he used to get out of a coke deal, and the other ten thousand he pocketed. But then he got arrested again because Sports Illustrated then went and told the Dade County State Attorney's Office that meant he violated his probation, mm-hmm. so he had to go back to prison. Oh. So now all of this craziness from the Dade County State Attorney's Office, I became the crown jewel of what they were trying to get accomplished because that statement that that guy made, that uh, we want to know the names of everybody you ever known, because they thought I was going to do that, but I didn't cave. So now three days before I get sentenced, Martin Dardis comes to the jail and uh, he comes up with four other people from the State Attorney's Office and from the court. And he says, you know, Mercury, you know, 15 years is a long time. And you're not sure whether or not you're even going to win on appeal. But I got a way to get you out of here right now. I said, how is that? He said, well, all you have to do is nod your head yes to these five names that we believe had something to do with drugs and gambling back in the early 70s. And so he names the five guys. And I'm thinking, well, where does this come from? Oh, we, you, you don't have to understand that part. All you have to do is just nod your head yes to it, and we'll give you $100,000, get your sentence reduced conspiracy, get you a stay of sentence, get you out on bond, and all you have to do right now is just nod your head yes to these oh five Lord. things that we said wow. had something to do with I said, here's what I do, man. I said, let me get this right. In two days, if I cooperate with you, I can go home tomorrow with a hundred grand in my pocket. He says, plus we'll fly you up to New York. We'll get John Underwood to help you write your book. Yeah. Right. So I can start spilling my guts out about everybody else. Right. He said, I said, you know what? Let me get this right. If I agree to this deal, you're offering me, I can go free, but if not, I got to go to prison. He says, well, that's, that's kind of like it. And I said, you know what? Come back tomorrow. So the next day they come back, I just wanted to see what they were going to do, how they were going to try to handle this. And so I said, well, uh, the next day on Tuesday comes, I said, well, I'm, I'm ready to talk. And they said, hey, hey, he's ready to talk. He's ready to talk. All right. Well, I said, now, I don't know about those five guys from the Dolphins, but I know about five guys from the white guys from the Kansas City Chiefs who were involved in the drug game back in the early. Oh, no, no, we're not interested in that. Well, we're not interested in that. I said, wait a minute. You're not interested in five other guys? He said, no, no, we're really interested in this story right here. I said, you know what? Come back tomorrow. So <laughs> then they come back on the third day. And on the third day, they call up and they, I said, don't even bother coming upstairs. Did you really think that for one second I was going to give up five players on the team and go along with a story you just made up. And the story was that these five guys had something to do with drugs and gambling back in the, in the, in the 72 and 73 seasons just happened to be that time. Sure. Right oh, here, wow. Baby. Right, right, right. That's the yeah. story they were looking for. That's the story because sports illustrated had become a, a, a flat, a part of that, whole makeup was that they dealt in sports scandal. And strangely enough, you can remember the, you, you're you not old enough, but they're baseball players at, that were, were involved in cocaine uh, back then. You know, the, the, the groove that turned into a rut. 
So mm-hmm. here's a guy. He's got a he's got a coke vial in his back pocket. So he's sliding into uh, second base belly first, so he doesn't mess up the coke vial. <laughs> <laughs> Craziness, man! It was wow. crazy. So, but, so let me. I'm go sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 no. You go. Well, what I'm saying to you is, is that this was a fix the whole time. Right. It wasn't about cocaine. It was about the players on the five, the five guys on the Dolphin team. They wanted to continue this kind of journalism, this yellow journalism where and it was only for black players. That's the, the thing that got me. But I knew one thing. I knew that my case was sound and that all I needed to do was go to an appeals court. Now, Miami, and when you read what I've written about how people live here in Miami, Miami is in Florida. Florida is the most Southern state, both statistically, euphemistically, and strategy-wise. It Coming down South gives you a great opportunity to change your life because of the weather. But it is also a mecca for the kind of racism and bigotry, and it still goes on to this very day. I just got caught up in it. Just imagine the nonchalantness of Mercury Morris having an all-white jury. Mm. For what reason? If right. you want to show that you're by the book, but they didn't want to do that. They, I had no witnesses against me, none except the informant, and they couldn't put him on the stand, so they get the coke dealer to testify against me. So they had no witnesses. And it's just so crazy, man, that I eventually won in the Florida Supreme Court. I lost in in the third district court of appeal, but the dissenting opinion written by a black judge named Wilkie Ferguson, who would go on to be a federal judge in a building named after him here in my downtown Miami, uh, Wilkie Ferguson said this was a textbook case of entrapment. Oh, the man wow. had no cocaine. You pursued him for nine days. You tried to put cocaine in his hand and then bust him with it. There's no foot. And then he still didn't have any of which you said in a warrant that he already had. Right. So right. the ridiculousness of how these people operate is, was, was crazy. Not the, the, what I just wrote in, it's called, it's called the quest to clear my name, mm. the state of mind of the state of Florida, an indictment. And that's exactly what it is. And I want you to somehow put this into play here for me yeah. at your end, because I want as many people to know that it, it's just like our conversation, because that's where this came from. If you have information, but it's misinformation, then the best you can be is misinformed. If right. someone is allowed to perfect the concept based upon that misinformation, then what you have is a misconnect, a disconnection. That's how I got busted by that misconception right there. And wow. that's how you just forwarded it to me, the travails of what occurred in that circumstance that they created. So the only way that I can change the narrative for you is for me to do what I just did, which was write a sequel to what really happened in that story. Because yeah. Sports Illustrated, now, I, I uh, there's a couple pages on here that I had to correct. Mm. And um, I was telling this story through Sports Illustrated, but this is what I wrote where there are a couple words that need to be out of place. It should be noted that Sports Illustrated, it should also be noted that Sports Illustrated and the people who were in charge of that sports magazine in the early 1970s picked the Miami Dolphins to lose in the Super Bowl in 1971 1972 and 1973. Mm. Now, what does that tell you about them coming to me, offering me a hundred grand? Uh, and then, and, and then that's a hundred grand up front. And then another hundred grand at a minimum when John Underwood helped you write your book. It mm. was just such a bizarre thing. And wow. uh, everybody was like telling me, even my lawyer that I got to argue in the Supreme court, because I took over after a while when I saw that this is how this system works. It's bullshit. Right, right. I got to I got to do this myself. So uh, I I took the, the attorney that was arguing the case. That Phil Glatzer was the guy who I would get to argue the, the an appellate 
court in the Supreme Court. And that Glatzer was an appellate attorney. He comes to me the night before I'm going to get sentenced because everybody was trying to tell me, gee, 15 years, you're going to, it's, it's, it, what happens if you lose your appeal? You go, I said, hey, I got one choice here, and that's to rely on the protections of the system that white men put in place. Mm. Now, I'm going to make sure that I get the same opportunity as if I were white. Right. Because if I were white and these other players are white, we wouldn't be here. Because their intent and purpose was the same. And it's always been the same. So Phil goes, well, Gene, you know, I'm coming to you the night before. And Phil is the same age as I was back then. He's in her 30s. And uh, he says, Gene, I, I just I just think you ought to reconsider uh, accepting this plea. Because 15 years is a long time. And you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. I said, Phil, I got no eggs and I got no basket. <laughs> All I have is what happened and the truth. And right. I was willing to chance that, that the system somewhere along the line would show that these people did this. And then, man, when I won in the, in the third district court of appeal, a black judge, because the two white judges, they strangely went along with what these guys were saying. Does that smell anything like what we're going through right this second? Right, right. Yeah. You know? Just remember this. Lawyers are number one on the mistrusted list, and then they become judges. Right. Politicians are number two, and they pick the judges. So take a look at that devil's triangle that we're existing in right now. And that happened to me in 1982. And I'm telling you that's so crazy what these people tried to do. When I won on appeal, that means the, the lower court dissent – was the, was what the Supreme Court adopted, not the denial, because in that case, I'm doing 15 years. But I was willing to take the chance that somewhere along the line, the truth would be known that this has nothing to do with cocaine. This has to do with the 1972 Miami Dolphins and five guys that these idiots from Sports Illustrated eventually put their names in, in I want to say 1986, that this article then came out. But back then, they were trying to get me out. So that's why the state attorney's office, it, their lead guy is, is, from Sports Illustrated, uh, Martin Dardis, he worked for the state attorney's office for 20 years. So he was a guy who they could bring in and think that somehow they were going to turn this around because they knew one thing. If I go on appeal, I'm going to win. Right. And that is what I did. I went on appeal and I won. But when I got out, I never had another trial. The Supreme Court overturned that case and said he's remanded back to court for a new trial. They never gave me another trial. They just called me in and charged me. I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to be getting uh, a new trial. And all of a sudden I walk in and judge goes, uh, I'm sentencing you to four and a half years, but I'm going to give you credit for time served. It took me three and a half years to get out to in a position where the Supreme Court would overturn their case because right. I knew they didn't have a case from the beginning. And yet they still tried to pursue it. And only today have I had enoughness of the Internet and people saying, oh, well, Merck was involved in coke and he was trying to do it wasn't that it right. was the maniacal bullshit from Sports Illustrated trying to make somebody look wrong in a circumstance where they were not. Right. Right. First of all, that's very illuminating. I'm, I can't wait for this book. Uh, this, this sounds it's not awesome. A book. It's not, stop. It's not a book. I already oh. wrote a book and I'm using that book as evidence because once again, I what this guy named Steve Pfeiffer, he he co-authored that book. That's what I say now. I say co-authored because for me, uh, I never really read the book. It's called Already Always Knowing. Your kids have it. I have it. I you've had it. It's like you think you think you know something because you already think you know it. And right. so hey, I wrote the book. I already know it's in there. I've only found out in the last six months what the hell is in that book. Right. What's in right. there is stuff that I used to write this story about how the state oh, okay. of Florida. So it's a story in for like, for like a screen for like a movie story or both. both. Okay. I, I met with some people from Hollywood and from Florida uh, and from New York uh, and a zoom meeting about three weeks ago. And uh, they're trying to attend this, but I told them I have to write the storyline because I have to write the narrative of how this goes. Yeah. And that's exactly what I did. And it took me two and a half years to finish. And even still, 
little things that I, I find uh, the, like when they uh, when they when this occurred and this was just last night. It should also be noted that Sports Illustrated and the people who were in charge of the sports magazine in the early 1970s picked the Miami Dolphins to lose in the Super Bowl in 1971, right. 1972, and 1970. And I just told you that because I wanted to tell you again that their whole thing was to destroy and besmirch the character of the 72 team. And right. that's why Mercury Morris got in trouble. And that's why they thought if they offered him 100000 and then another 100000 when you finished writing your book, that all this would go away. But instead, but get their story. Later, hello. Right, right. Wow. First of all, that's the, that's an incredible story. I, I'm i sorry that you had to pay with three and a half years of your life to get Wait to that story. Wait a minute. Stop. Stop. I didn't have to pay. I grew. Right. Right. So that that part of it, if you find yourself in a jackpot like that, there are one or two things you can do. You can cave like Phil suggested or you can fight it like I suggested. And as many times as I've watched To Kill a Mockingbird <laughs> and, and thinking that's me sitting in that seat, being the only black person in there, if unless I'm black. Because if I am, I'm up in the balcony because in the due process world, I'm not allowed to be down in front unless I'm on trial. Well, 1982, there I was and to kill another mockingbird, except it didn't work. And the irony here, and maybe it's, you know, more ironic to me only because I'm such a big fan. But that's the year that the Dolphins actually went back to the Super Bowl since 73. Right. Yeah, it was like it was on the eve of them going back into the Super Bowl. So it, it kind of makes sense with your account because here Sports Illustrated now interested again in focusing on the Miami Dolphins and maybe discrediting them as an organization and 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 sort of cherry picking you to kind of tell that story. Yes. Exactly. Wow. You're, you're 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 evolving, man, in this little store time here, but I guarantee you this. <laughs> You think you think you know about this story? I'm telling you now, you don't. Oh, I and don't. nor does anybody except the ones who have been trying to hide it. Mm. But now it's coming. So that's so, why it's... I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, so, go ahead. so no, look, look, basically, first of all, thank you for that level of, uh, of of insight. I do feel like I'm evolving, and I wasn't expecting to evolve. Um, in this conversation, but I'm so happy that I am. And now oh, I want to cool. devolve to the early, early days of you growing up uh, in Pittsburgh. Um, did I get that correct? You're, you're from yeah. Pittsburgh, right? Born yes. and bred. Yes. Um, yeah. tell, tell me a little bit about that. How did a young Eugene Morris evolve and become the, uh, this, you know, at the time, uh, I believe, you were you broke all the records in college football when it came uh, you yep. know to rushing yards and OJ Simpson I think broke them a little bit like later but you were the guy a week later, <laughs> a week later. <laughs> but I broke all three most yards in one game most yards in one season and most yards in a career and that was from West Texas State University a uh, little school uh, right outside of Amarillo Texas we played teams like. Uh, uh, Utah State, New Mexico State, Colorado State, Arizona State, Texas Tech, uh, those kind of teams like that. We were ranked in the top 25 oh, back wow. then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I they probably it. haven't been back. They probably haven't been back to the top 25 since then. Oh no, they're now uh, uh, they're now the they're not Division One anymore. Right, right, they're, right. They're, they're they're the other division. But you know what's crazy is that during that time. I can, and I'm saying this because my mind just flashed uh, to show you what the times are like. Mm -hmm. Daryl Royal, who was the coach of the Dallas, I mean, of the uh, Texas Longhorns at that time, uh, in 1967, they uh, they played with the idea of possibly having a Negroes play on their football team, mm. and Daryl Royal said, "I see no need in having Negroes play on our football team." Because that was the climate back that's a, then. That's mind-blowing to me. Hold it. When I went to the Dolphins, I don't want to jet ahead, but when I went to the Dolphins in 69, 
uh, we we practiced up in um, in Boca Raton, and sixty nine now, it's still segregated in the SEC. There are still no blacks in any team in nineteen sixty nine, and for the first time, I because uh, I played on an integrated team in Texas, uh, there were some guys that went to Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, LSU, who on that football team, there were whites who never played with any football with blacks and blacks who had never played any football with whites. Wow. Because this is the turning point in 69 where I'm coming in right as everything is about to change in terms of society, lifestyle, opportunity, choice, and coaches. Mm. And getting rid of George Wilson, this guy – he was he was a three ten and one coach, uh, because when uh, when I came down, they they brought the first five draft picks down to Miami uh, in sixty nine in February sixty nine, and I get up. They, they each guy had to get up and say, "You were drafted by the coach before Don Shula." I was drafted by oh yeah, I was drafted yeah. by a guy named Joe Thomas, who yeah. was a, a stellar person for picking people he picked all the people that would eventually go on to become stars here in Miami but but Joe Robbie is the guy who wanted me down there and I remember a quote in the newspaper saying uh we picked up number 22 uh Mercury Morris you know he was the league leader I mean in, in college football and uh he's a great runner he's going to be a great kickoff return man plus I like his name <laughs> <laughs> right right you know th there's like I also so like my my background is in media. I've I've owned several media companies. I've worked on a lot of television shows. Of of um, you know I have a movie in development uh, with Lionsgate. So like I've been in this business oh, yeah. for a long time, um, uh -huh. and and I've always been fascinated. Just to riff with you for 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 a moment about this story of the Miami Dolphins in its very very early days for one specific reason that. The way that I've heard the story, okay, and you would have a million times more the insight than I have, but the way that I've heard the story, Joe Robbie started this uh, franchise in Miami in 68, I believe, or 67, no, 66, 66, 66, 66, and his kind of master plan was that he was going to build this football team in Miami so that he could uh, introduce our culture to soccer. And his idea was that he was going to put a guy named Gary Yapremian on the team who was a soccer star. Okay, and, stop. Okay. Stop. 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 Yeah. stop. Number one, the time sequence that you're talking about this fable can't yeah. work because Garo was playing in 1971, excuse me, in 1969 for the Detroit Lions. And Ooh. Okay, he, fine. He he was simply he knew nothing about football. He was a soccer player from Cyprus and uh, not really a football player. He couldn't really speak good English, but he was one of my best friends throughout the whole time. We called him Keebler because he looked more like the Cookie Man on that box <laughs> than he did a football oh, this player. This is awesome. This is awesome. <laughs> so when when Garo comes and he's and I, I God bless him, Maritza, his wife. Uh, I was with her at our last event, you know, and I was telling her about she was telling me about Garo, about how when the first extra point that he kicked and it was good, he comes running to the sidelines. Oh, I kick a touchdown. I kick a touchdown. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know anything. And, and but he was the quintessential concept of someone who was only a kicker. Mm. That was his job. He wasn't a punter. He wasn't. A, he was only a kicker, but he was one of the best kickers that this league has ever seen. And you know, he made the Pro Bowls. He did. You know, hey, he wasn't a football player. And and the the bad part about it is, he's known for that play in. The, in I know the, Super the perfect Bowl. season, <laughs> the perfect game. Yeah. Fourteen yep. to zero. It would be to this day the only shutout in in Super Bowl Hold history. It. Stop. Stop. Okay, no, he kicks the field goal and it's 17 nothing, and we win 17 and 0. Right. Oh, God. I, I didn't even think about that. Of course but, you didn't. <laughs> but I thought it was an extra point. I, well, 
It was a I'm sorry, it was a field goal. goal. It was a field goal. That's right. That's right. That's right. It's 14 nothing. Oh, he, God, but it was a well, last God, you, you, Yeah, you win the Super Bowl 17 to 0. That's yeah. it. It's a perfect. And you know what? When they the, the perfect season came from when the the game was over and they had the countdown on that big screen in the in the Coliseum, it said Rinkin, Dolphins are perfect. Dolphins are perfect, and that's where the perfect season came from. Wow! A perfect, a perfect seventeen and zero. So, as a former season ticket holder, I didn't renew my contract uh, like as of three years ago. Even though I, 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 this is actually the first season I don't go to a game in probably like twenty five years. Right. I, I'm a hardcore Dolphin fan. I've had Mr. Marino himself, uh, you know, on the interviews. So I'm deep within the Dolphins thing. You know, I absolutely love the Dolphins. And I've never, I've never had the opportunity to get an insight from somebody as insightful as you and as good as you are with your words about how it was in that locker room um, relative, like, did the Garrow thing not even happen in you guys? Like, like, like when you guys were in there, like you didn't even care about that. Right. Like, like, like that wasn't even relevant. Of course not. Why would we, our <laughs> goal was to get there and win, not dice. Hey, if we roll this night, we can go 17 and 0 and been 17, nothing. We got our ass kicked. <clears throat> Excuse me. We got our ass kicked the year before. That's yeah. what was on our mind. By at Dallas, that walking back in the yeah, yeah. 20 was it 27 24 7 right don't remind me it was 24 3 <laughs> 24 3 we're the first team that didn't score a touchdown <laughs> right, right, right. hey and, I, and i'm going to tell you something right now there's a picture around here that i have it's all tattered and torn but it's from 1971 in the locker room when i'm sitting there in my uniform and everybody else is getting dressed and i'm the only one that's still dressed in his uniform Right, and right. so it's quiet. You can hear a pin drop because we had come all that way. Keep in mind now, 69 were doormats. 70, the transformation comes because, see, you can't tell this story unless you explain the transformation because it's, wow. it's, it's how everything evolved into being the way it was because of karma and luck. And luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that's what occurred when, uh, and but first I have to tell you that George Wilson had just as much to do with the fate of the Miami Dolphins because he was a coach who was on his way out. He loved being in Florida because he coached in Detroit. Mm -hmm. So being down there smoking cigarette after cigarette and, having the same kind of coaches around them, you know, they're all puffing up, going away. <laughs> they didn't really care about any competition. And we were, we were right off the box in 1966 and it's now 1969. So we don't have any real relevant history. And then the 69 comes. And I remember when I said that, I thought about the summer of 69 is when the, all of the craziness that was going on in the country, Woodstock was 1969. The week we went to camp was Woodstock. The week they walked on the moon was the week we reported to camp up in wow. Boca Raton. Yeah, and so yeah. I'm a rookie. This is a three-year-old team. This is a team that has only history in losing. They have a coach who is really not interested in winning. So you have that perfect combo of lethargicness of uh, being played out on television. In Joe Robbie, uh, the genius that he was, Shula, ironically, I was at the Super Bowl in Super Bowl three as oh, wow. a spectator watching because my agent had flew me down to Miami. Uh, his name was Norm Youngerman, alias Norman Cohen, alias Norman Young. <laughs> <laughs> I find out afterwards. But he flew me down to Miami and uh, took me to the Super Bowl. And I'm sitting up there watching Earl Morrill take a, get taken apart by Joe Namath and his crew. And I right, uh, right. was 23. And I'm sitting up there in the nosebleed seats, but I'm there. 
and I watched that how this game developed, and there you got to see an inkling of it didn't take as long as you people in the NFL, NFL thought it was going to take because, after all, it was only football players. And they came the same way that they came to you guys, except now you got a different breed and it's being run by a guy who wears a mink coat on the sideline and big shades and it's out <laughs> all night and messing with the mafia and doing all the crazy stuff that people like in addition to winning. Right, right, right. To, to go down and predict that you're going to win against Don Shula, who parts his hair to the side when he gets out of the shower. The first thing he does, doesn't dry himself off. He goes to the mirror, gets some Vitalis, puts <laughs> it in his hair, and then combs his hair. Right. And I'm saying that because I know because when we got our ass kicked by the Cowboys and I'm sitting there in my uniform while everybody else is getting undressed and one of the coaches just told him that I was out there uh, talking to the press. And keep in mind, he's a guy who had never won the big one. He lost in, the, in the, the Colts as a Colt. He lost to the Cleveland Browns, and then he lost to the, Jet, to the Jets, and now he is, he loses to the Cowboys. So he's a guy who can't win the big one. I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm going to be playing this game because uh, I, I'm the only one who can run sweeps here. Jim, I love him, but he was not a sweet man. I right. was. Jim King for everybody Shula, out there. Shula didn't have the confidence in me, and I give him that. To, to give me an opportunity to play. But I had to make him do that because when we got our ass kicked and we went in the locker room, everybody was just kind of getting undressed real slow and you, you could hear a pin drop because we were fitting the room with what who we were. Mm. We were people who were out of our league. Only I'm sitting there, I'm pissed off because I'm saying, hey, why didn't I play Dwayne Thomas the guy who played in the backfield with me at West Texas State, when I'm number one in the country, Dwayne is number 10. So we had two top 10 rushers from West Texas State. Why is only one of them playing? He's mm. starting for the Cowboys. And the only time I was off the bench, and this is what I told the press, the only time I was off the bench except for the kickoffs was the national anthem. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and then I made this bold declaration if I'd have played in the game, we might have had a better chance to win because I'm the only one who can run sweeps on this team. And so now one of the coaches went and told Shula. And, and so now here comes Shula, Vitalis out now because he had just got out of the shower. He's still wet, but his hair is combed. Back in those days, yeah. if you, think, you watch the commercials, you can see how his hair looks like yeah. all the time because he paid attention to that. After he comes his hair and he's still wet and he's got his towel on, he comes up to me and he says, if I find out you said anything, you've had it. I said, wow. okay. So now, now we're in New Orleans. The next day, I had to leave and go to Los Angeles because I'm playing in the Pro Bowl as the AFL kick return champion. Right. So who's the automatic berth in the Pro Bowl? So uh, I go out. And the, 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 this, this is the real Pro Bowl, not like they're playing tag now. I know, right? I know, I know. <laughs> Come on. And, and, but it's only fitting that you should see if, that, that in 69, uh, when, well, in 70, when they merged and it became the AFC and the NFC, yep. that is when, but the rivalry was still there between the AFL and the NFL, and it showed up in the All Star games. In the Pro Bowl. So we wanted to beat these guys. You know, they're around for 50 years and we're around for 10. But right. we wanted to be to show them we belong there. And then all the Nitsky, Butkus, uh, I mean, all those guys, uh, uh, just a, a great time as a rookie. Uh, not really, was a two-year guy seeing these guys and playing at that level. And because I won the kick return championship, I was out there. So now the running backs for the AFC – were uh, uh, Leroy Kelly and Floyd mm. Little. Mm. So these two, uh, and I'm the kick return guy, but I'm a running back. So Leroy Kelly it comes up to me in the first half, and he said, listen, young blood, we don't <laughs> want to play in this game. We just, You just stopped playing last week. <laughs> 
We haven't played since before Christmas. Last <laughs> right. thing I want to do is go out there and get hurt and have to spend the rest of my summer getting well. <laughs> right. so we're going to tell a coach to give you a shot. <laughs> so they, they do. And McCafferty, who was the coach there, because we had beaten uh, Baltimore in the AFC title game. So he was the coach. And and uh, uh, I'm trying to think if it was Landry. Yeah, Landry was the, uh, the other coach. And so when – when they <laughs> when when they came out, well, Landry wasn't the coach, but he he, he commented on what occurred then. Right. Uh, they let me play in the game in the second half. I I do pretty well. I gain about fifty or sixty yards, uh, and, and I I break off some good runs, and I set up the scores that allowed us to actually go ahead and win. Mm. And so then the next day, McCafferty says in the paper, he said, "Listen." I gave that kid a chance because he said he could play. And I'm glad because he made the difference in, in us winning that game or not. And so then uh, uh, Don, now the day that uh, after I said that, before I was on my way to the Pro Bowl, right, right. Don says, I find, if I found out you said anything, you had it. When he called me up the next day in his office room before he was going to come back to Miami and face the music, he said, listen, I wouldn't want to go – with a player. I wouldn't want a player on my team that would be satisfied with not playing, but we wanted to go with the guys that got us here. I said, coach, getting here isn't the thing. Winning when you get here is the thing. Wow. You of all people should know that. Oh my Lord. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. You what? told this to Don Shula's face. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. His birthday is January 4th. My birthday is January 5th. And My like mom's is the 6th. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, I'm sure you'll find a little bit of her in this, too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah anyway, that's amazing. I, so anyway, now, they, he, they give me a shot to play, and now they're lamenting that I'm, that I'm glad. So now this is making Shula look a certain way because you got the coach who, who, who he beat. He gives me a shot to play, and I play. You got – the the guy who we who, who Shula lost to, and he got him saying he's glad that I didn't play against him. So he's automatically wow. second guessing Shula. So now in seventy two, and in the summer of seventy two, uh, a month before we got ready to come to camp, he calls me from to my house my, my house and tells me to come up. He wants to talk to me in his office at the camp. So I go up, and he says, "Listen, I'm going to give you an opportunity to play." Uh, I talked to her with the coaches. We think we're going to give you opportunity to work you in and see if you can take it and see if you can handle the in and out aspect of it. I said, that's all I wanted was a shot. So now he's still, there's that gym, there's that gym kick, Larry Zonka, Butch and Sundance kind of thing mm. that they had going for themselves. And it was partly too, because Miami is the most southernmost state in the United States, both geographically and euphemistically. Mm. So that's why you had people that like Larry Little, who when he was coming up, he couldn't sit in the Orange Bowl except in the seats in the end zone because that was the seats. Those are the seats afforded for Negroes. A Hall of Famer. A Hall of Famer. Yes. Who, who, who owned that field. He couldn't sit in that game, although he said he used to sneak in anytime. That's how good it was <laughs> the security. They sneak in the game and go in the end zone. And play. But but my point is, is that this was all around the time of the, the, the molding of the circumstance when we get our ass kicked, when Shula realizes that, hey, I got to give this kid a shot. He gives me a shot. And the, the rest is history. But yeah. I owe it to him to that he could have traded me, could have done something, but he he did what he thought was best for the team. And uh, just to kind of give everybody else out there some insight, if I remember this correctly, that year you led the NFL in scoring touchdowns. I believe he had 12. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, and you led the league. You got 1,000 yards. First um, time ever. Yep. Yep. Our jer junk and my jerseys are hanging in the Hall of Fame now because of that. and you know what's so crazy is that I thought about this recently, but I never had the nerve to say it to him that if I could be right now go back in time 
I had going into the last game of the year in 73, I had 954 yards. I was leading the, the league in yards per carry average at 6.4 yards per carry. Uh, and and uh, at the last game of the year, I, I had 956 yards. Zonk had, nine, I had 954 yards. Zonk had 946 yards. He let Zonk uh, – I'd gotten hurt a couple weeks before that, and for some reason I was ready to play then. And and I do this right now. I'm talking about recently I've done this. I wish the hell he would have let me get those other 46 yards. So <laughs> Zonk and I could have been not only the first two, but the only back-to-back -back team oh, to do it. Oh, that's amazing. But he held me out. And when he said it to me, I'm seeing him saying it right now. Wow. He said, uh, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold you out today." And I, instead of saying, "But wait, coach, I do this now. I've done this this week." Right. Talk to him from the dead. Right. Right. <laughs> said, "Don, why did you let me? Why didn't you give me that shot so that we would have made that kind of history? Because it was ripe for the making. It's right. just." But certain things didn't work out, and, and that's okay. It didn't because what we got out of it team-wise, I'm perfectly happy with. Yeah, and, and, and also the ass-kicking that Minnesota Vikings got, you know, oh, that, yeah. that same, oh, you know, yeah. same postseason. Oh, yeah. You know? oh, yeah. Well, you know what? By that time, we had honed our situation into such – we were a machine, and our uh, the way we played – you see all these guys, they felt all this enthusiasm and all this emotion and all that? We didn't. <laughs> we played with a cold, calculated tactfulness that allowed people to do what they needed to do. There was sometimes you go, hey, I congratulate people on what they did. But the bottom line is that the regularity of what they did on offense and defense was consistent with what we did in practice. Because our turnaround came when in 1971, after we get our ass kicked, we come back that summer he tells me he's going to give me a shot. We report to camp, and the first thing he does is play the Super Bowl from Super Bowl six. Mm -hmm. And so he comes in like he's real, like happy to see us and everything. And oh yeah, hey, listen, you guys, uh, we're going to watch some film now. So he turns on the projector, turns off the lights, and here we start watching the game from when the last time we were together, from when we got our ass kicked by the Cowboys. Right, he started right. to go over the mistakes like they happened the day and a half ago. Mm. And, and it was seven months. And so after that reaming that we had on the first day, he turns off the projector and he says, now, you see how sick you feel now? You see how sick and sorry you feel now? Well, just think of how sick and sorry you're going to be if you don't go back and redeem yourselves for what you did last year. And mm -hmm. I forgot to tell you, it was just as much my fault as it was yours because you can't be world's champions unless you win all three seasons. The regular season, the playoff season, and if you're good enough, your season boils down to one game, and that's the game you got to win. Now, we're walking out of here. Coaches and I are going to be go. Now, what you guys need to do is figure out a way how to get this shit done. Mm. And he walks out and we're stunned because this is day one and we just got reamed out right there. And then he put it in our lap. It's okay. Now, what are you going to do? We, we were like, okay, we dedicated ourselves to a man that in practice, we were going to do whatever it took to create what was on that paper that he drew up for us to turn it into a game plan that we would then put into place on Sunday that was sufficient enough to beat anybody that we played. So it wasn't about how good we were. It was about how specifically we were pre prepared we were. You see all these guys like Philadelphia and all of them, they all get caught up in that we're 8-0, and we're 9-0. and Ours was, hey, the last time you were striving for this, you got your ass kicked when you got there. Right, and that right. Was what, that was our report card that we had every game we played. Just remember this, 23 to 3, or whatever it was that we got our ass kicked by the Cowboys. Yeah. That's that's what it was, 24 to 3, yeah. yeah. And, and that was our motivating factor. So I'm saying all that to say – because my mind, I'm seeing when we were in the locker room and Zonk 
and his locker and Kick and I, our lockers were, were close together. And this guy comes up, this reporter, and he says, "Oh, how does it feel that you guys uh, that you guys won 17 games?" And Zonk goes, "Hey, I'm just glad to get the old man off our back." <laughs> right, right. So because that's this, what it was. So this is episode 42 of this show. I've had 42 great guests on here. There was a 42 on your team that we haven't brought up, who's also an icon and a legend, you know, the great Paul Warfield. What was he like? What was he like? What was he like? Oh, I would say you probably can't see this real good. Oh, wow. I can see it great. Yeah, yeah. He was oh, a contemplator. He was a thinker, huh? Yeah, that's right. He and I had many an intellectual discussion on the bench. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. A great player, a, a, a guy that you see these kids now, they're good because they're good because they're good. Paul was special. Because he was special, he was special. He could run routes that made defensive backs have to learn math. <laughs> right. Because that's how he beat people, by simply counting his steps how many steps did it take for me to make you think you think you know where I'm going? Which is <laughs> right. why he often ended up by himself. Oh my God, that's incredible, man! This has been this is such an incredible uh, chat, man. I'm so I'm so, I feel so privileged to get you know a chance to talk to you. One one more question because I want to be respectful of your time, and, and and we're definitely going over here. But um, what was the relationship like between Robbie and Shula? Uh, it was <laughs> when you said that in 1990, I think it was, I had been long gone. We were, we had some kind of reunion, like a 25 year reunion for the dolphins at that time. And yep. they had this thing downtown. I remember and, it. Uh, I remember it. Oh yeah. 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 I totally remember it. I, I totally okay. remember it. Well, here's what happened there. And Don, uh, uh, he and I, kind of we had this kinsmanship that you know we both enjoyed and he comes to me because robbie is telling don don's talking to somebody like like uh the godfather he's talking to somebody and uh Rob, robbie goes uh oh, sure sure get back up on the stage we want you on the stage and don looks at him like is he talking to me <laughs> i said he's not talking to me <laughs> and so now don gets pissed because he thought Robbie was being disrespectful when he's in a casual conversation with somebody and somebody's telling Don Shula, all right, all right get, get up on the stage here. Like, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> right. Especially with Don Shula. And especially January 4th. And right, I fully right. relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so would you say that the relationship was – was was very positive or was there some like conflict there or was it just like of course of course there was conflict because joe robbie was a certain kind of individual he joe robbie got don shula so that don shula could make joe robbie look good right right so right. that was a working deal that worked itself out long after robbie was gone so he robbie got the better end of the stick but so did don because he got to inherit the the uh mash crew from the 1960s uh that that eventually when the turn of the 1970s came and life changed when the 70s came mm. integration i remember in 1971 after we lose in super bowl six uh sam the bam cunningham was a, a runner from sc and he played against Alabama, and, and Bear Bryant scheduled the game in Alabama, in Tuscaloosa, because he wanted, and which was all segregated mm. right there. So black people could watch the game. They had to watch it someplace else outside. Oh, my Lord. So now Sam the Bam Cunningham, he ran over all them little white boys that were playing there on defense for the Alabama, dragging them in the end zone, humiliating them. So at the end of the game, they get their ass kicked. Bear Bryant, the, uh, one of the announcer guys, goes, well, now that uh, you see that the, the effect and impact that Negroes could have on the football team, would you consider having Negroes play on your football team? And he said, well, I'll tell you what. I may not be the first, but I won't be the third. <laughs> Profound. 
profound wow. for Bear Bryant to tell you, I may not be the first, but I won't be the third. Right, and right, right. How the SEC became a what DNA is, is, factory from right. the slavery days. Oh, that's that's fucking crazy because even last night, right? You have this SEC team completely embarrass this whole college football playoff system. It's yep. like you can't like like this college football playoff system is good in theory, not great in execution because you know the first two games were good, but you see the disparaging quality between like the two teams in the championship going for it 62 to seven. I mean, that's, you know, that's just, you know, you know, it's absolutely incredible, but you know, I think one of, one of my big takeaways, and if you have the time, I'd love to get you back on here and have that discussion further is because I'm younger and I've always, I grew up in Miami. I went to South Miami Elementary, South Miami Middle School. And as you know, when, when you came there and, and, and you're a member of the community, Miami is an incredibly multicultural, integrated right. city, right? Like sure. you can't grow up in Miami. I'm Cuban, as I'm sure you know many Cubans. You can't grow up in Miami and not realize that there's a bunch of people all in the same place, all at the same thing, and that we just have to coexist and grow and learn from each other, right? Like that's how Miami kind of is, right? Like growing up, you you know, everywhere you look, somebody's from somewhere else, you know, with a different ethnic background, etc. But right. I didn't know that just 15, 20 years before my growing up, it was so segregated. You know, like it's it, we, we kind of look back at the past a little bit with those rosy colored glasses because we just kind of assume back then it's the same as it is now. And it's not, you know, and and, and I thank you for reminding me about like it's impressive what you did as a football player. But it's 20 times more impressive to me now when I realize the context of which you did it, in, you know, and, and all yeah. of the challenges that you had culturally. I mean, it's yeah. It, it's really hey, something, you know, it, you know, this, anyway, it, it's hey just man, something wait, sober. Stop, stop, because you just let you just flip the switch for me, too. In, in accordance with what you just said, what I went back to, because once again, it don't call it a, a book. It's a sequel story to Against the Grain, the book that I wrote. But it's the truth. Mm. If you can't hold it out, it's the truth about when you're going to be dumbfounded when you see the lengths that these people went to, to try to, to try to make that real and how I refuse to do that and how they still to this day have to find a way to be right about being wrong. So mm -hmm. that they still won't acknowledge. You see it in politics now that, that how ridiculous it is that people will lie to your face yeah. and think they're getting away with it, but not care if they don't, because there's so many of them like that. The, yeah. This is crazy, but I learned a great deal from living in Miami and 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 seeing what the system is. And make no mistake, when you read this story, man, you'll call me back and I'll say, OK, yes, I'll do a story with you on it because it is so exactly the opposite of what you think you think, you know. Right. Right. That is right. what is so. But it's a good story because it contains the facts, the evidence, and the law. And that's how I've learned to do that. Over here, uh, this right here is my, uh, it's, it is the Burt Bell, Pete Rozo NFL player retirement plan as the defendants and the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit Court. That's where I took them to court. And then, uh, and the reason I'm telling you this is because I was going through my emails and I found the letter from the two letters from the Supreme Court. One, this one is called a petition for writ of certiary. It means to review again. I was after I lost in the 11th Circuit, I lost in here in, in, in the Southern District. I then appealed. Uh, this is a case against the NFL to the uh 11th Circuit, and from the 11th Circuit, you then go to the United States Supreme Court, where they determine whether or not you are uh, – that your case has enough merit in order to be heard. I just found yesterday 
I was denied in conference. Now, what that means, I got two letters. One saying that the Supreme Court had accepted my appeal and it was going to be on the docket. So that means if they got 9,000 cases, the petition for writ of certiorari, they throw out 8,920. Wow. They keep 80, maybe, sometimes 65. So if you're in that 65 and you're going to be heard, that means out of the 9,000 cases that came before them, it was the clerks of the court who operate under the facts, the evidence, and the law to determine whether or not this case is worthy to be heard by the seven, by the nine justices on the Florida Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. My case was worthy law-wise, to meet the criteria of being heard by the nine justices. So I was denied in conference. That means that out of, the, out of those 9,000 cases, they keep 65. If you're in the 65, that means your case has merit sufficient enough to be heard by the United States Supreme Court. I intend on going back now, seeing what's there, and I've learned this. A judge is not the court. And you'll see this in my, my, my paper. A judge is not the court. A judge is an officer of the court required to interpret the rule of law. Mm. The body of laws that make up the judicial process, that's the court. Now, the case in point, while there are no courts in prison for violating the rule of law, there are lawyers and judges in prison for violating the rule of law. So what they have done for me from the time I got busted and got set up, I became a zealot with regard to the law. I took the NFL to court five times on behalf of other players seeking disability benefits. And I won four out of the five times. Mm. Four and, the and one, reason, baby. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Four and one, baby. You're, yeah, that's a winning record. That's a winning record. <laughs> hey, but anyway, the point I'm saying is that this the, the football has encompassed a lot of things yeah, and yeah. what you're seeing now with all the cte and all of these other things that have occurred and and this kid i feel badly for this kid but he didn't get hurt playing football he had a pre-existing circumstance that caused that to happen because if that were the case dudes would be falling out all the time because it wasn't an, a, a tremendous hit i've been hit so hard that a guy hit me on a kickoff return. He knocked himself out. <laughs> right, right, right. I know. <laughs> Look, it's a violent game, and 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 sometimes you can have an, a condition and have no idea about it because it's never, ever, ever shown its face. You know, until now. Until, until now, yeah, yeah. And that's what you got to see. I, I and as much as I see everybody rallying behind him and doing all this other stuff, the man had a heart problem to start with. So it wasn't the violence of the game. It was the fact that he had a condition. When that kid died in 1971, Hughes, uh, uh, for Detroit, he yeah. didn't even stop the game. Didn't I, even stop the game. So I didn't know about different. that until just recently because I read up on it just recently after this you know, event unfolded in the Cincinnati game. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, I didn't even know about that. You know, it, it, that, that situation happened at the very, very end of the game. Uh, not that it matters, but you know, um, but yeah, you know, it's um, it's amazing that it's only that you know that it's actually so little, right? That 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 it hasn't happened that much, you know, because now, of no, stop that, man, stop that. Every time I see you going down that kind of road, I have to stop you because it's a dead end. Right, Number right. one, <laughs> you're speaking from the stands, so I I respect your opinion about it, but what I'm saying to you is is this game has always been a violent game. Always. One way, shape, or form or another. I, I got – I was playing in an all-star game uh, down in, uh, in in Dallas, and uh, Juice and I were the running backs for the AFC for the Pro Bowl in uh, 73. And uh, I was sick. I had a cold. I couldn't – I told Juice, I said, man, I can't go. And he says, man, you got to go, man. I said, I'm just here by myself. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, I can't go, man, because I got I, on the first play, I got hit. Then it, who's on the other side? Nitsky, Butkus, all right. that crew. 
All right, right, right. right. I, I carry the ball. Juice is in the first quarter. I'm in the second quarter. On the first carry, they run a sweep. Yeah. That guy from, get, for, from the Vikings is probably there on the line. No. Uh, oh, yeah, all those guys are there. Purple people eaters. Yeah, yeah. I'm telling you, the guy who hit me was Dick Butkus. <laughs> and where did he hit me? Late when I was out of bounds. Oh, he boy. speared me in the back. I played one play. I was hurt for seven weeks. Oh, I had a hip Lord. pointer. Yes. It was crazy. But, but just – the idea of the violence of the game. Back then, they tried to hurt you. This time, these guys try to hurt you on camera so that it looked like how they're going to look when slamming you down. That's how Tua got hurt. Don't right. look at Tua. Look at the guy slinging Tua down to, with a vengeance in his face. You could see what he was trying to do as he strained to try to gather more speed to bring this guy down to the ground with a harder crash. Mm. All they talk about is Tua, uh, uh, him hitting the ground. Look at the guy's face, and you'll see his intent. Wow. His intent was to sling him down as hard as he could, not caring about whether or not he got hurt, because right. it's a game where people get paid to look that way. Now they're trying to put muzzles on it, and act like somehow the basis of the game is no longer what the basis of the game is. Right, right. Did you understand that? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's deep. It's deep. I'm processing it, but I, but I did understand that. You know, <laughs> I um, just like um, since since you brought up Tua and the Finns, you give them any chance this Sunday against Buffalo? You know what, man? I, yes, I do. I give them a fifty-fifty chance. It's because that's what you have. When, when it's you get 50, on the field, 50, it's, yeah. No, it's 50 no, no. 50 to start with. Right. It's not once you get on the field, it's once the game's over, you assess what you have. Because right. your fact that you're getting the opportunity when everybody else is going home lets you that you've gone to what, like I like Shula said, to the second season. It's anybody's now. You got a 50 50 shot, just right. like the coin toss. Right you, right, you have just as much chance to win as you do to lose. Just as much chance for heads as it is for tails. It just depends on what you call. Now, to show you that, Larry Little, uh, uh, Bob Greasy, and uh, Nick Bonacani, they were the captains. Mm. Normally, uh, Nick or Paul, uh, Nick or or Bob would make the determination of uh, heads or tails. So just as a tradition, Nick and Bob said heads. And they said heads once, twice, 14, 15, 16. We get up to the 17th game. And, it, and Larry Lill says, hey, hey I, I want to call it. <laughs> he calls it tails. <laughs> and guess what it is? Tails. Head. Oh, it's heads. So that you guys called 16, 16 heads in a row. You guys all won all 16? Yes. Oh, yes. Wow. Wow. And that's the coin toss. <laughs> wow. Wow. That was 1973. We won the coin toss 16 out of 17 times. The only time we win it is when Larry Little has to call something else. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. That's amazing. Oh, last question. Last question yeah. for you, man, because it, it, it's like every year – uh, when you guys crack open that champagne, I always think of you and you've become the kind of uh, poster boy or the figurehead of the team. Um, and was the sweetest champagne the one uh, from the Patriots losing the Super Bowl? Was that the one? Actually, man, I wish I could say that you're correct in your assumptions, but right. you're not. OK, that's why I'm asking. I'm, that's why I'm, I'm asking. I'm like this. Uh, I, I didn't root against the Patriots, because why would I? I have right. no effect on the outcome of the game. Sure. Did I think the Giants were going to win? No, I didn't. But I didn't think the Patriots necessarily were automatically going to be 19-0 and because something somewhere in every single team that has played somebody that has been a uh, unbeaten they find a way to rise to the occasion and make that disappear because their intent is that to make it disappear on the other side and for us 
We win 16 straight games, and they make us dogs in the Super Bowl. Why? Oh, they can't win 17 games. Guess what? We already won and 16. We only got one to win. And the end, this is the one we lined up with the 16-4. Now, take this conversation right where we started it. 1971, when we got our ass kicked, when we came back and watched us get our ass kicked in 1972. And it was a reminder that those three seasons Jula talked about, the regular season, the playoff season, and if you're good enough, your season boils down to one game. See, nobody told that to the Patriots because they'd already printed up their their 19-0 and shirts that they had somewhere in a manga in, in Guatemala. Somebody's wearing a shirt saying, <laughs> hey, I was a 19-0 Patriot. <laughs> But not really. <laughs> right, right, right. That's amazing, man. This has been amazing. Uh, oh, God, uh, there's so many questions I could jump in with you. Hey, but another time, man. I promise yeah. you, I'll do it another time. But but only on the, this, that you be one of the surrogates for me. When I give you this story, I want you to read it because I'm making a play for the truth to be known. And the truth it's is all called, that matters. It, it's called the quest to clear my name, an indictment of the state of mind of the state of Florida. And as you can see, I'm not a lawyer, but I can play one on TV. Yeah, you and can. You, yeah, you when can. When you read this, you'll understand why. I beat lawyers. <laughs> they yeah. fear me because I know how the law works. And I know that that this system does work, but you have to make it work. Yeah. And that's how I am sitting here now saying to you, I won in the Florida Supreme Court. And then when I came back, they tried to pretend like I didn't win. So what's in place right now, right this second, is you thinking that I made a plea deal and then I got out of prison. I had a 20-year sentence, but then I made a plea deal and then I got out early because I was doing so good uh, uh, helping kids not be around drugs. That was the narrative they created to right. slip away. That was a part of it because I remember you talking to me as a child. Yes. Yes, and you know what? You never heard me say something about don't do drugs because drugs are bad. Make the right choices when you're crossing right. the street. <laughs> That's what you told me, man. And look, I, uh, Eugene Mercury Morris, I have never forgotten that. I have always appreciated it. I, I, I could see you on the stage right now. Right. Your hair was a little longer. It was a little different. You know, oh, yeah. But, but I, I totally <laughs> Actually, remember. Actually, man, I still have just as much hair. <laughs> Wait a minute. And I, I'm going to only do this for you. Oh, 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 there it is. There it is. Oh, yeah, yeah. So let me ask you a question just because I have to know this. Do you remember well, going to South Miami? Yes, I do. Yeah, that's I amazing. I in South Miami. Yes, I do. I remember it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The little kids. And I tried to just give you a message like uh, try to do – try to make choices that work. And, you know, you got the door number one, door number two, and door number three. You can have anything you want behind door number one, anything you want behind door number two, and anything you want behind door number three. But yeah. what's behind door number three, if you find yourself in a jackpot, hey, like Adam didn't make the right choice. That was what it was about, the apple. If he, if he got talked into it by Eve. So if he doesn't <laughs> make that choice, we're not the same. But we had to make that. He had to make that choice so we could be like this to understand the difference between the two. Amen. Um, I'll never forget this. And this will you'll never definitely not remember. But South Miami. Uh, elementary was actually a magnet school. It was one of the first magnet schools in the country where uh -huh. people would come there specifically for the arts, music, drama, etc. Right. And um, for this day, they had three paintings up, and one of them was my painting. And, oh, uh, wow. yeah. So, like, I was always like, I couldn't believe it. I had Mercury Morris and my painting up on stage <laughs> and, and the lessons that came from it. Um, again, thank you so much for being on the show. You're welcome. I, I look forward uh, to, um, you know, to broadcasting your message after you finish up the story. And I look yes. forward to chatting with you again. Yes, me too, man. Me too. It was fun. All right, cool, man. Thank you so cool. much. And thank you guys. Bye-bye, everybody. All right, take it easy.